object. The second idea that I want to convey is that bioinformatics is a very much data-driven area. So if you want people in bi biology and in bioinformatics to trust your results and to talk to you, to try to test the results, as you heard in uh, Gil's talk today, you have to give them, uh, you have to work with real data and give them enough uh, of a belief that this data you process properly in the presence of noise uh, that you didn't try to do some very low-level modeling that may lead to wrong results, but in, in the end you can give them something that they would be willing to check out and test. And that is what I'm going to focus on in the second part of the talk that we'll be dealing with compressive sensing and low rank completion methods for gene, uh, gene regulatory network analysis and for protein-protein uh, interaction networks, two topics you heard from Anand in, uh, during the morning talk. And Although it appears to be a difficult task to reconcile these two areas, the hope will be that in the future we will be able to do much more jointly uh, with the bioinformatics folks and uh, biologists in general. So as I mentioned, the first part of the talk I will focus on group testing for experimental design and on a paradigm of compressed genotyping that started recently to emerge uh, for the purpose of uh, screening uh, individuals for the presence of some rare mutations that may cause debilitating uh, genetic diseases. And I will mention one sub uh, problem we are working on right now, which is extremely interesting, called synonymous coding studies, which very nicely ties up to the uh, area of group testing and coding theory. In the second part of the talk, uh, I will discuss gene regulatory networks and protein-protein networks through a uh, lens of a new uh, technique we introduced that we call causal compressive sensing or Granger causality compressive sensing and if time permits I don't want to uh, water down the subject too much lower end completion and as you can tell the joint theme for these two topics is the fact that we are using sparsity in the data to address the issues and just because I was playing with my slides until the very last minute to try to accommodate a lot of the topics or explain more problems and ideas from the topics you heard in the previous days, I would like maybe in the last five minutes explain in a, with very little detail an extension and a generalization of the problem that David Che talked about. The whole class of problems that exists in bioinformatics called uh, reconstructing sequences from traces and in particular reconstructing or assembling uh, uh, protein sequences, not DNA sequences, using uh, a model of tandem mass spectrometry. So this is the agenda. It sounds pretty uh, uh, bold for the like, end of the day, but I'll make sure to go through the slides very slowly, introduce relevant concepts, go easy on the mathematics so that you can easily follow what's going on, and then I can give you uh, a lot of references for this material. So let's start with group testing. I checked that, uh, what the background of the uh, new uh, students basically is, uh, and I've noticed that there are very few coding theorists here, and I figured it would be very nice to introduce group testing because it's one of the long forgotten but still very interesting areas in coding theory that emerged around the Second World War. And the idea behind group testing uh, is associated with Dorfman's work, who had the unpleasant task to test uh, soldiers uh, for syphilis during the recruiting process. And the idea was that blood tests were pretty expensive to perform, and there were quite a lot of soldiers, but hopefully people should have some belief in their uh, armed forces that not every individual or a high fraction of individuals is infected by syphilis. So his brilliant idea uh, was to take five individuals at a time, mix their blood samples, and perform only one test on five blood samples. Unfortunately, the idea didn't work well in practice because when you mix uh, five blood samples, if there is, let's say, one affected individual, when you mix those five blood samples, you get dilution, and sometimes it's not possible to detect if there was a pre uh, some uh, defective individual, sorry, infected individual <laughs> present in the poll. So just not to involve syphilis and other kind of uh, scary subjects so late, Let's try to explain how group testing could be formalized in a coding theoretic framework in terms of trying to identify my favorite subjects, uh, animals, uh, in a test pool that involves, let's say, five animals, two of which are cats, did I count the six animals, uh, five, two of which are cats and four of which are dogs. So let's say the positives or the rare elements in the set are cats, 
So if you design a test uh, matrix, what you're really doing is you're designing a binary matrix which says the rows are indexing the tests and the columns are indexing the test subjects. And if I see this dog appearing with the signature 1011, that means that the, uh, the sample of the blood, let's say, of this dog was used in test 1, test 3, and test 4. Uh, the sample of this cat's blood was used in test uh, 2 only, and so forth. And if you get the test result 0101, which means uh, I detected no uh, 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 positives in the first test, because both the cat 1 and cat 2 were not involved in that test, I get a 0. In the second test, I detected the presence of a uh, positive, a cat, but that's due to the fact that in test two, cat one was included in the test. And then I didn't detect anything in the third test, and I detected something in the fourth test. That basically gives you the signature of these two uh, the, uh, positive subjects or cats, and that is what group testing is all about. It says you're allowed to use a budget of n tests on n subjects, and the assumption is that the, num the positive subjects or the subjects you're trying to identify, the number is much smaller than the total number of subjects in the pool. And so this is what group testing is all about. It can be mathematically special, uh, defined or easily described by saying that each of the elements, test subjects, has the signature which corresponds to which test it's involved in. And the outcome of, uh, of all the test measurements can be summarized by a vector which is nothing more than the module two, uh, sorry, which is nothing more than the binary or operation, component-wise operation on the signature vectors. And you notice that this is very similar to coding theory where you use XORing on the columns of a parity check matrix. Here you're using OR, the OR logical function, because something is positive or test positive if at least one subject in the pool is positive and the test is positive. And hence you're not dealing with XOR functions, you're dealing with OR functions. And the problem that people have been dwelling on a lot in uh, the mathematics community, uh, starting from the 50s and 60s, is can you save in the number of measurements or in the number of tests when you want to dis discover n positives of their effectives along n subjects? And a very familiar result emerges that basically you can get away with the number of measurements that goes down, or tests that goes down from n to log n. So uh, coding theorists took a strong interest in that in the early 60s and then forgot about it. And the work done by Kautz and Singleton, uh, you've probably heard if you took coding theory about the Singleton bound, really focused on designing matrices or test matrices which will have two interesting properties, one called the separable property. And it says nothing else than that the test matrix is good. So if you know that you have not more than n positives, it says, any time I take the signature of L positives and some other subset of, subset of S positives, their, uh, their overall signatures should be different because I should be able to discriminate between any L group or S group of uh, positives one from another because that's how a good separable matrix should work. And it will tell us that we can easily discriminate or figure out which of the subjects uh, and uh, uh, n subjects were uh, positive. This junk matrix matrices that are defined in a slightly more complicated way. It says that uh, the union of the supports of the signature vectors, uh, where the support uh, the that you cannot take more than n vectors at the time, should not contain the support of any other vector that is not already included in this union. And this is a version of the separable matrix that allows for quick decoding and goes under the name of this junk matrix. So why are we interested in such matrices and where did the interest to, into group testing come back on, um, into bioinformatics especially in the last few uh, years? And the story is basically related to the very well studied and mentioned SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. And you heard, and I'm just going to repeat it again, that uh, nowadays there's a lot of interest in trying to define or identify the very small number of locations. Remember we said we have <coughs> 3.2 million uh, bases and uh, the most uh, uh, people, uh, people's DNA is mostly different, uh, different in these so-called single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are nothing <coughs> other than single changes 
uh, isolated islands of changes consisting only of one nucleotide in genetic sequences. So for example, these may be parts of the genetic sequence of a bunch of uh, individuals, and you will see that the majority of the population in some location may have the nucleotide A, while a very small portion may have G. So this location will be called a SNP or a single nucleotide polymorphism. Why do we care about SNPs? Uh, the list of conditions and diseases that are associated with single nucleotide polymorphisms is growing really large. This is a very uh, basic list that, found in the, that tells you that, they, um, uh, that the single nucleotide polymorphisms are involved in diseases as, let's say, benign as asthma or lung cancer or lupus, which are far uh, much more complicated and dangerous diseases. And how would we really test if people have uh, SNPs that may cause these diseases, you heard several times that uh, healthy individuals have genes and that the genes, co genes come in pairs and that if an individual is healthy, that individual should have uh, two alleles of one given gene, one from the mother, one from the father, and both copies should be healthy. Now what we call a carrier of disease is a person that has one normal and one faulty copy of a gene basically a copy that contains uh, some single nucleotide polymorphism. And the idea of genotyping is to perform genetic tests that will identify carriers of diseases. And why do we care? Not just in the case of SNPs, but other diseases. Uh, you don't really want to see certain photos, and I didn't want to put them in. Ty Sachs, Lou Gehrig's disease. A lot of uh, families, for example, there is a big push to start the screening techniques um, in, uh, Jewish, in the Jewish population. Unfortunately, there are a lot of carriers of certain genetic mutations in small populations, like Ashkenazi Jews. And uh, when people get married, their ideas are to have family, which is pretty normal. And a lot of children, unfortunately, get two uh, uh, dysfunctional copies of the gene, one from the mother and one from the father. And there is a big push to do some genetic screening and testing before a couple decides to get married or after a couple is married just to pre prevent such tragic events in the family. They do it in Israel, by the way. Yeah, I will talk about the work uh, and all the stuff that we were doing with uh, some people like Noam Chantal and uh, Yaniv Early, who are basically talking about the starting of company, so in Israel, that's uh -huh. what they told me, yeah, for genetic screening. So how, how, would, uh, how would the ideas of group testing help in terms of performing these screens, screenings? Uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, such single nucleotide polymorphisms, or in general, uh, 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 blue berries or uh, uh, other diseases, you could do the standard approach. You can take an expensive sequencing platform and still expensive $5,000, $6,000 if you have to do it within a family is not uh, you know, something that is easy to afford for a lot of families. So if you want to do the screening, you can say, okay, let's take the DNA from a single individual, sequence it, and when you sequence it, we can, you can hopefully tell, sequencing is prone to errors, but you can hopefully tell if a SNP is present or not, or if some mutation, doesn't have to be a SNP, is present in the sequence uh, part of the genome. But unfortunately, as I mentioned, it's not just the fact that you would have to run out this ten, five, six thousand dollars to sequence that part. It's also the fact that the sample preparation is also pretty expensive, usually not counted in the cost of sequencing. So a very low-hanging fruit idea would be, uh, why not do what Dorfman did many years back and take DNA from a number of individuals, sequence the whole pool together, and then determine which things are present based on some kind of combinatorial group testing scheme, like the one that I described in terms of using mixing agents. And this idea basically was first proposed many years back by a group of Russian mathematicians. And they published in our IT journals, talked a lot about the potential of group testing, but never really tried to implement it in practice. And then some really smart people from Cold Spring Hardware Lab, the lab, early, Early, uh, and Noam Shenko, who was actually an information theorist, said, why don't we try using this idea in, uh, for uh, uh, sequencing? And can this work in practice? The question is, how would you, if you try to use combinatorial designs, you're avoiding the problem of tagging the sequences. So you now don't have to know which sequence came from which individual because tagging DNA sequence 
expensive. So the question is, would this work and what kind of results would you get? And I tried to enlarge this, for some reason it didn't work. Apparently it got extreme coverage and it uh, received a lot of interest in the genomic uh, uh, research literature. The cover page of the issue that appeared maybe two years ago about using uh, group testing for uh, genotyping called the new uh, idea basically DNA Sudoku. And if you Google it, you will find a lot of uh, interesting links to it. And uh, it earned Yaniv uh, the title of one of the 10 most promising researchers in genomics. And you feel, oh, isn't this awesome? Such a simple idea from uh, uh, computer science and coding theory, whatever you want to call it, can go a very long way. And if I, uh, uh, when, I, uh, when I'm done with the second problem that I want to introduce, I'll tell you what they did and what kind of experimental data they got, and then I'll continue with explaining what are the new interesting challenges, theoretical challenges associated with this work. On another note, I want to mention that this was a nice and very straightforward application of group testing. Another one which is even more interesting in my opinion, because it's quite unexpected, is a really new emergent area that I personally name synonymous coding. There's no um, name that is hard to fluctuating around, just a bunch of ideas that people are thinking about with respect to using uh, group testing in, uh, uh, in genomics. So you heard several times yesterday and today that there is, here based on the central dogma, DNA gets converted into RNA, RNA gets uh, translated into proteins, and this is the basic structure of the circle of life in some sense. And you also heard that we have four bases, and that each amino acid is uh, encoded by a triple of bases, which gives you 64 options, but you have only 20 amino acids. So the genetic code is redundant in so far that you have uh, quite a few of these amino acids, not almost all of them, encoded by several different triples. So for example, both the triple TTA and TTG encode for lucid, one of the amino acids. And what this is called, usually in the literature, is synonymous coding because you have a triple, two triples that code for exactly the same amino acid. So does it really matter if you take the genetic sequence and you start playing with it and you replace certain sublocks of the genetic sequence with its synonymous code, will the DNA or the organism continue with its operation in an undisturbed way? And you always have to be careful with biology. Yes, you take a coding theoretic, re a coding region, something that is a gene, part of a gene, let's say an exon, and you substitute, let's say, only one of the triples with the synonymous triple, a triple that codes for exactly the same amino acid. And guess what? The organism may die. And there are a lot of studies that are trying to uh, identify which regions, coding regions, are uh, not possible to substitute with uh, synonymous coding because the exact sequence uh, uh, information is required for the function of the organism. And one explanation that may uh, uh, explain, my, one explanation that can tell you what's going on there is the fact that when you chop off, let's say, a DNA sequence into pieces and say, I'm just going to replace this one piece with its synonymous code rather than its wild type, W usually stands for wild type, is that you go from DNA through transcription to RNA and then to proteins, and when you transcribe, you form an RNA sequence, which is a single-stranded sequence, and may fold into itself. So it may fo uh, form a, a shape, and the shape carries a lot of information and attracts different proteins and different enzymes to operate on the RNA. So if you change something in, using its synonymous code, the shape of the structure may be completely different, and that may cause all the trouble in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the cell. So uh, that is basically the second problem I'm going to talk about related to group testing. And let me now describe what kind of ideas or novel ideas did uh, the early lab or people that are working with synonymous coding, what kind of ideas did they have to come up with that define neat mathematical problems to look at? So uh, one thing you would never think if you don't work with uh, uh, real biological equipment is 
that the robot may ruin your life and that the robot will tell you what kind of mathematical construction structure do you have to use for, uh, for testing. So one of the interesting results that gave you early this way, uh, and this was published in the special issue of molecular biology we organized uh, two years back, is that the robots have a hard time making moves, and these robots are the uh, entities that dispense the genetic material into wells, which, can, which are then used for pooling, or for group testing, the robots may only make highly restricted movement, movements and they have a strong preference for diagonal movements. Which means if you have to place the genetic material in, uh, of one person, you better start uh, the genetic material of uh, a group of people. You should be able to make a lot of uh, placements in, the, in a diagonal fashion which introduces the idea of using matrices or uh, group testing matrices which have a lot of ones placed on diagonals. And another thing that came uh, about is that sparse matrices are good because you have a limited amount of genetic material. And a French bioinformatician introduced something that has the very unfortunate acronym STD, uh, which in his world stands for shifted transversal designs and in some other world may stand for something else. So uh, I don't want to go into uh, the details of what kind of results they found, but all they did is they took the shifted transversal designs, which I want to briefly mention are nothing else than uh, disjunct codes discovered by Kaus and Singleton uh, that you obtain by taking Reed Solomon codes. But unfortunately, it wasn't really known for, uh, to, buy, to the bioinformatics people at that time. They got pretty, pretty good results. They got uh, very good results in terms of tests, for example, in this case involving coverage of four, four, uh, 450 pools for 5,000 individuals and two defectives, and that basically got them the glory of uh, a lot of publications, a uh, company or two companies uh, aiming to do the sequencing, uh, group testing, uh, sequencing design, and a lot of other uh, interesting things. But what they still had trouble with is precision when they have more than two test subjects. Things became uh, more and more complicated. And the other thing is the reduction in the number of tests was not as spectacular as the theory would tell you because they had signal dependent noise, readout noise, the precision they were supposed to take the same amount of genetic material for every, from every single individual. Just remember the matrix was a zero one matrix. One stands for a certain amount of genetic material. How do they make sure that all the ones in the design are actually ones? It means every single subject, they should have to uh, take the same amount of genetic material. So the one thing that we did, and uh, it's uh, in collaboration with, some bio, uh, with a biologist, is to come up with a group of constraints that can be added and must be added into the group testing design that will allow you to overcome a large number of the problems that uh, 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 the early lab and other labs had. And I will mention only two or three such problems, and they're too complicated to explain in detail and talk about the mathematics uh, uh, with a lot of rigor. But the first thing that you have to uh, um, take into consideration is that it may, makes much more sense from the perspective of precision and quality of the test uh, result to uh, take non-uniform samples of, of the subjects, which will bring you to matrices that are no longer uh, binary matrices. And it will shift you from the paradigm of group testing where you do OR, logical OR, to uh, something that in the information theory literature is known as the error channel or the math channel. The second thing that very frequently cannot be addressed in a simple manner is the fact that individuals have something called a copy number variation for their genes. So far, you may have heard that every individual has two alleles, two copies of the same gene, one from the mother and one from the father, but that's not quite true. Biology is full of exceptions. There are individuals that may actually have up to five copies of a gene, and there's no uh, 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 it doesn't have to mean, uh, it doesn't mean that all the copies came from one parent or another, it's just the genetic regions are redundant and an individual basically may have up to five copies of the same gene. How, but how, is, it how is it expressed in 
so, so basically, what, uh, what that would mean is if you have five uh, copies of the same genetic region, it doesn't mean that all of them are going to be expressed at, at every single point of time, but it means that the concentration, when you, for example, sample, take the test subject, you will see the same region appear five times. So it doesn't mean that it's necessarily that those five copies are all expressed. I mean, it may happen that uh, if you have such an overexpression of uh, genes, the organism will not survive, but you're doing sequencing. You're just taking the genetic material and you will actually find that you, you will see a certain copy with a certain defect, not once or, uh, or zero times, you may see it up to four times. So this is known as the copy number variation problem and it uh, makes each of these individual cats or dogs carry a certain weight with them because when you include a sample from that individual, it means that you have to count that sample according to its copy variation number. Uh, I mean, yeah. Because you sequence all of the individuals before you put them in the matrix, so that you know what the copy number variants are. No, you you don't. So the, the idea is to come up with something that can handle the copy number variation problem mathematically. Okay. So now I'm assuming that uh, these individuals, as I said, or these test subjects, have a weight which I know is. Uh, usually zero or one, an individual either has no defect or has one defective gene. If it has two defective genes, the disease manifests itself. We don't really need to do any uh, screening, gen uh, uh, genetic screening. So we will just look at individuals that are potential carriers. Those are the ones we want to identify. So we don't know. There may be some that have high weight, but the good, uh, the good thing is those that have a copy number two or three are very rare. So that will introduce some nice and easy to handle uh, ideas about sparsity on the second level. So you can assume that you have one level of sparsity where you had ones with a certain sparsity and then two with an even smaller sparsity level. So that, uh, that is one of the questions. The second question is the limited precision of the readout of the, of the device. So that is basically something that brought us to the concept of semi-quantitative group testing. And the easiest way to think of it is, if you have a scale in classical group testing, you say everything that's below one is viewed uh, as a zero. So if there's no ne uh, positive subject, you will always see zero. And if there's one positive subject, two positive subjects, or so forth, they're all going to be detected as a one. It says at least one subject was present. But now uh, what you have in this framework is that uh, you have finite precision, but it's better than just the group testing scheme which tells you you have a, at least one defective present. You know which range uh, or which number you read out. It's in a certain interval, and you can call this output, let's say zero, this output one, this output two, and it all, all it signals to you is that you identify anywhere between 20 and 30 uh, sequences of that type or fragments, reads of that type. So that can be also seen in some way as a, as a quantized version of an adder or a MAC channel that I'll come back to a little bit later. So the other thing is that the same mutations may be involved in multiple diseases. Uh, and in that case, you would like to do something along the lines of two-dimensional testing, but I won't talk about that. And diseases run in family trees, in families. So is there something that you can use as a side information about the relatives or the people's identity that you're testing in order to reduce the number of measurements even further? Because it may make sense to pool individuals from the same family in different pools, or does it make more sense to pool them with, within the same group? And this is something that we call probabilistic group testing, and I'm just giving you a flavor of the ideas that are going around. So uh, for such schemes, you can do the classical standard information theoretic analysis to see what, are the, uh, uh, what is the best number of measurements you can get. And it's pretty complicated. A lot of these things you can solve only partly up to some extent uh, using classical information theory, then you have to resort to uh, optimization theory, numerical simulations. But in general, as I mentioned, the problem is basically one of having an error channel over a discrete alphabet uh, where the inputs may have different weights, and then doing some form of quantization after it. 
And the nice thing about all these problems when you start digging into the combinatorics literature is that, as you heard many times before, the Russians looked at it decades and decades ago. So Malutov, Yachkov, and a bunch of other uh, information theorists you probably never heard of because they don't go to ISIT conferences. And they usually publish, uh, Malutov, for example, publishes in the Siberian Journal of Mathematics, which is very hard to read or get track of, uh, get hold of. Published a lot of work on, in terms of doing group testing schemes and map channel through an information theoretic lens. And they came up with a very nice uh, framework that views these problems through uh, a, a set of problems involving parallel channels and the mathematics is too complicated. All, the only thing I want to tell you is you, using those ideas put forward by Malutov especially, you can show that there is a very nice and simple uh, characterization of the semi-quantitative group testing and a lot of other uh, of these uh, group testing frameworks in terms of a function that involves nothing else than the mutual information is expected between two sets of uh, uh, random variables involving subjects, uh, positive subjects, but partitioned in a certain way such that uh, you take this uh, mutual information, normalize it by the number of subjects that you use in the groups, and then maximize over it. And that's where the optimization problems come into picture. So you can compute the classical capacity curves, show how much gain you can expect in terms of the capacity when you start using non-binary pooling scheme. You can start designing codes based on disjunct uh, uh, codes and use belief propagation algorithm for decoding. And what is pretty neat is you can also come up with the best possible probabilistic designs where you take, for example, in this case, a ternary alphabet 0, 1, and 2, with pro where 0 appears with probability 0, 18, 0, 64, for uh, 1 and 0, 18 for 2, and then find the best quantizer for this scheme that would give you a capacity achieving uh, 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 semi-quantitative group testing. And just quickly back to the uh, synonymous coding constraint, so just not to forget, the idea was that uh, can we detect which areas in the DNA sequence uh, carry a useful signal that cannot be replaced with the synonymous code, the idea was put forward just a few uh, months ago by Skiena, who is a bioinformatician at uh, Stony Brooks, I believe. And the idea was as follows. If I have a DNA sequence that I want to test for important subsequences that may carry a, a relevant signal that cannot be uh, replaced by a synonymous code, uh, I should uh, try to do some group testing, obviously, and I should try to divide the sequence into subsequences. So in this example, I would take the sequence, divide it into 16 pieces. And then what I can do is I take one such sequence, replace this wild type or the original with some synonymous code and check what happens to that sequence. Then I can take the other piece of the 16 uh, uh, chunk sequence, replace it with a synonymous code and see what happens. But you can tell immediately you would have to do this for each region, for each pairs of these 16 regions, for each triples, to see which areas basically carry a useful signal. And the other thing that is noted, for example, is that whenever you go from a wild type, which means the original sequence, to a synonymous code, you have to perform an incision in the DNA sequence, basically cut the sequence and paste a new sequence in it. So here I would take part of the wild type sequence and another part that is not the wild type and paste them together. But uh, uh, now I'm talking about this sequence, the real DNA sequence. Here I would have to do this pasting together at one, two, three points. So the question is, all these operations are really expensive. Can you design a scheme where these uh, cuts, the number of cuts is minimized and you are still able to perform some kind of group testing where you can identify which region uh, harbors the signal where you can, are not allowed to mess with, this, with the code. And the idea is very straightforward. I drew just one special example. Take a hanging code. Well, I guess all of you just immediately see that this is nothing more than the heritage I make of a hanging code. But arrange the columns using, in order of uh, using gray co a gray code. Because when you use a gray code,
know that every time you go from one column to another, you're allowed to make only one change, which will minimize the number of transitions you have between wild type and synonymous coding part. And there are a lot of nice problems for coding theorists in this area, basically how to design cyclic disjunct code and another part of things that you're working on that I don't want to mention. But I just want to give you an example and tell you about some other work related to this problem that says that uh, you, the reason, the real reason, or probably the reason why the, the synonymous coding may not work is the folding issue. And um, just so that you know, RNA folding has been really well studied and there's a lot of software available for uh, testing if, a DNA if an RNA sequence will fold into a two-dimensional shape. So basically you have a one-dimensional sequence but the ATGCs, or U's in the case of RNA, act, uh, may act as sticky points that can uh, bound or fold back onto their complementary uh, 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 basis and then form two-dimensional shapes. So what you probably can tell from these two pictures, you can tell that the folds are different. You can definitely tell that the shapes are different. But what you cannot tell is that there's only two triples of uh, uh, nucleotides that were replaced with their synonymous code. And one such coding gives you this fold and the other coding gives you a completely different fold. And a way to analyze this is also through a coding theoretic problem that we used many years back to discuss something in DNA computing called uh, um, combinatorial RNA folding. So just as a side remark. So in terms of group testing, I hope I bombarded you with enough uh, information and gave you a flavor of and a lot of interesting coding theoretic problems that lie in this area. What I really want to go over quickly in the next few minutes is explain a very straightforward idea. And I'm not sure how much time do you have? I Maybe 10, 15 minutes. Oh. Okay. We start at 30 minutes later. Okay, okay. So I So uh, all of you are probably familiar with the compressive sensing framework. So what I'm going to do is just quickly tell you a few sentences about compressive sensing, and then just go to the main idea of causal compressive sensing, and of range or causality-based compressive sensing. And just for the sake of time, I'll may skip the experimental results and the synthetic network results, because you can find them on the slides. It shouldn't be too complicated. So what is compressive sensing? When you look at the group testing problem, it is a coding theoretic problem where you went from XOR to OR and then from OR to adder to the adder channel, but using discrete alphabets. The same ideas fluctuate, started to fluctuate around uh, maybe 10 years ago in the signal processing community under the name of compressive sensing. And it became a really big problem. A lot of work was done in this area. And all we have to imagine now is we're going from the world of binary valued or purely valued signals to the world of real valued signals. Then the idea is very similar to what we just talked about in group testing. You have a vector which you know contains only a few non-zero entries or only a few <coughs> positives. And you want to be able to uniquely reconstruct the ve uh, 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 vector based on its signature, which is nothing else than the sum of the columns of a sensing matrix. So again, the idea is that you can make the scheme work in, uh, in polynomial time, polynomial reconstruction time, if you have a number of measurements or a number of rows in this matrix or signature like ve uh, vector that is much smaller than the number of test subjects, again of the order of k log n over k, uh, if the matrix phi has some nice simple properties. Uh, I don't want to go over them. You probably heard about the RIP, rest in peace property, and the uh, uh, incoherence property, and there are a lot of reconstruction algorithms that you can uh, talk about. So now what I'm going to show, and I skipped a lot of the stuff that you saw probably about transcription factors, is how can you use uh, compressive sensing techniques for gene regulatory analysis? And this morning, Anand told us about Boolean network models, told us about probabilistic Boolean models, Bayesian models, 
So the model that we are going to use is none of the models that I uh, mentioned because we're going to deal with uh, models that are linear, that's usually easy to do. They may be nonlinear, but it becomes more complicated. And they're of the, if you ignore, uh, if you ignore this f function here, there are models that tell you that you have a discrete time update rule. And that was something that was not considered very good. But you may have a, a, a matrix, a time varying update matrix, and it says the values of the gene expressions at time t plus 1 are nothing else than the linear, the linear combination of the gene expressions at time t of the genes that influence a given gene plus some noise. And if you remember what Anand was telling you this morning, uh, gene interaction networks are sparse. There are not very many genes that can influence the behavior uh, or transcription factors that may influence the behavior of one gene. So this matrix A here will be a sparse matrix. So if you have this model, basically you have a dynamical system where the, uh, the values of x at time t plus 1 is nothing else than the value of linear combination, sparse linear combination of the values of x at time t. So how do we combine this with so-called Granger causality? So Granger is a Nobel Prize winner in economics, and he proposed a very straightforward idea somewhere in the 60s in terms of how to deduce if one random process causally influences another random process. And the idea was, at least for the autoregressive model, to uh, start with an explanation or an estimate for a random variable at time n by using the previous time uh, values and then try to capture the estimation error through the classical mean, uh, mean squared error. So if you, on top of it, uh, include in your uh, model uh, a, 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 shift, a bunch of shifted versions of the random, of the random process y, does the in, uh, estimation error increase or decrease? So if y has some influence on the behavior of x, including y in this expression, should definitely lower the error, the mean squared error. And that was really all there is to it in his explanation or in his model. And it has a lot of drawbacks. People nowadays insist that we call it the uh, Granger causality, not just cause causality because it may have misleading results. But it's the simplest example that you can explain in five minutes and see how to couple with a compressive sensor. So uh, rather than going through all these derivations, let me explain, uh, for the sake of time, how we are going to couple uh, uh, compressive sensing and Granger causality to see if two genes, if one gene is causally influences another gene. And so here is the idea. We are going to collect the expression data of genes into column vectors. And just as a quick reminder, the expression and values of genes at different, at different time points are the concentration of uh, messenger RNAs at given time points. And we are going to collect them into a sensing matrix. So just imagine your compressive sensing matrix now has columns that are expression profiles or expression levels of genes that, uh, of one gene, column one, gene one, column two, gene two, measured at different times. So if I uh, exclude a certain gene, let's say gene C, because I want to test if another target gene depends on it or is causally influenced by it, what I can do is I can pretend that I have to solve a bottom compressive sensing problem. My observation or my measurement is the concentrations or the expression profile of the gene D. My sensing matrix is the collection of expression profiles of all the genes except gene C, and then I have some residual or some noise basically in this model. So if I run this experiment, I will get, let's say, run some of the algorithms for compressive sensing reconstruction with a certain sparsity level, I will get a certain uh, estimate for the residual error, or how close do we come to the correct uh, value of y. The next thing I can do is now I can take a different sensing matrix, which agrees with this matrix in all columns, except for the fact that I added the expression profile for C as well. So what I'm doing here is I'm really artificially in this compressive sensing framework adding the, uh, the Granger causality uh, uh, model, because here I'm dealing with a sensing matrix that doesn't involve C, 
And here I'm dealing with the sensing matrix that involves G and C. And if this uh, problem gives me a solution with the same sparsity level but with a much smaller mean squared error, then it means that C actually causally influences the behavior of, of uh, T, of the target G. So uh, we did some experiments. Let me show you how the experiments were done. Uh, there's something in statistics called the coefficient of determination. When you do such experiments, you have to make sure that the mean squared error drops very significantly for you to declare that there's some causal, uh, causal connection is there. You have to have some other uh, issues addressed when you view it in this compressive sensing framework. And the result is that when you do it on synthetic data, or you do it on real data, and this is a very small sampling of the so-called SOS network in E. coli, an uh, emergency response network in the bacteria that gets turned on if the uh, operation of the cell is uh, compromised, you can basically reconstruct a lot of these causal relationships or pairs of interactions very precisely, except one of these interactions that just seem to be completely puzzling associated with the I, a certain gene that uh, is very prominently involved in the uh, SOS network. And as Gil explained this morning, sometimes you get an unexpected result. You start looking into uh, when your data set was published or gathered. This was the famous Gardner data set from 2004. But unfortunately, Gardner didn't have these results from 2011, just came out explaining the role of the I, so basically confirming that a lot of these causal uh, relationships in the Gardner data set were not correct or not complete, and that a lot of them can be deduced from this simple framework. So I skipped a lot of things just for the sake of time. I really am not going to go through protein interactions. Uh, you can imagine where that is heading with, in terms of lower incompletion. I can talk to you offline about it. In the last just two, three minutes, I know we're running out of time. I want to quickly tell you just two slides on how to reconstruct sequences based on traces and basically explain a whole family of problems David touched upon, David, uh, David touched upon yesterday. So uh, this is a pretty well-known problem, actually, studied even in information theory, and I hate to say it goes back to the Russians, Levenstein, late 80s, 90s. And the, uh, the idea he had was Let's assume you have a sequence, forget about DNA sequences, a simple sequence, and you pass it through a bunch of parallel channels, each of which can introduce a distortion or some, uh, uh, create some errors in the sequence. And then at the output of each channel, you get a distorted version of the sequence. The question Levenstein posed was, how many channels do you need in order to be able to uniquely reconstruct every sequence presented to this uh, number of parallel channels? So for example, with these channels, you can use substitution, deletion, insertion channels. You can say that each channel can introduce at most three substitution errors. You can say that each of these channels can introduce at most uh, five deletion errors or something like that. And a lot of work was done afterwards uh, without pretty much knowing about Levenstein's work. And some of uh, the papers really referred to him as well. One example is Mitzenmacher's work from 2008 and then a bunch of other papers followed. So when you look at the genome assembly problem, just to quickly refresh your memory, that uh, David talked about, uh, you now have a genetic sequence, and your channels are the shotgun uh, sequence, subsequent, uh, substring extractors. So you put one sequence in, and what you get at the output of one channel would be a substring of that sequence. That's what David called a read. So the question is, how many reads you need in order to uniquely reconstruct the sequence. So it really very much uh, follows within this reconstruction by uh, uh, through traces framework, except that the channel is a very special channel that doesn't introduce errors, just gives you a substring of the sequence rather than uh, this, uh, the, the, an erroneous version of the sequence. There's another problem that goes into the same category of reconstructing sequences based on traces, and in this uh, case, you are given not, uh, you know the positions where you break the sequence, you're breaking it in either the locations of prefixes or suffixes, or you can take any subsequence, but you're not given the subsequence itself, 
you're just given the composition of that subsequence. So to explain this problem to you, uh, you have a sequence, and let's say for simplicity, it's a sequence, a uh, binary sequence, and the traces or the outputs of the channel that you get are the sets of elements that appear in all possible substrates. So for example, the first element is S1. You will see a set S1. Then, because there is a prefix S1, S2, you will see S1 and S2, but as a set. So you wouldn't know if S1 followed S2 or S2 followed S1. You only know that there were two symbols next to each other, S1 and S2, but you don't know in which order. So another example, for example, here you have the symbol 001. You will say, I saw an isolated zero, then I saw another isolated zero, and then I saw another isolated zero, then I saw a one, isolated one. So these are all the substrings of length one. I saw a, sequence, a substring of length 2 that contains two zeros, I'll write that as 0 squared, another one, 0 squared, and then I saw a substring containing 0 and 1, I'll encode this as 0, 1, but it just means that I saw a 0 adjacent to a 1, but not exactly in that order. A 0, 1 should be read the same way as 1, 0. So the question is, can you reconstruct a sequence based on these traces? And why is this relevant? It's relevant because that's how assembly of proteins is done. You can view this multi-set information, or this set of multi-sets, as the masses of the fragments. So in a DNA assembly, you get the exact uh, identity of the fragments, or the reads. In protein spectrometry, uh, mass spectrometry, you get only the masses of the fragments. You don't know if you got L, L, S, you just know the total mass of the fragment. The weight of L, the, the mass of L, the, plus the mass of L, plus the, the mass of the third component. And so this problem, uh, we studied quite a lot with um, our owner Lizzy uh, from UCSD, uh, and it was published at ISP 2010, uh, of, uh, and it showed something, and that's where I'm going to end with, something really surprising, and we didn't dare ever putting it for to a biologist, because it says if you can, can, you can reconstruct something uniquely up to reversal, reversals are impossible to tell apart, you can reconstruct it uniquely based on the length of the sequence. If the length of the sequence is less than or equal to seven, you can reconstruct everything uniquely. If it's greater than or equal to eight, the only way you can do unique reconstruction is if n plus 1 is either a prime or twice a prime. And you imagine going to a biologist and saying, next time you take your reads, make sure they're uh, of prime length, because there's some magic working with primes. So this is one of those things that David mentioned, you don't really want to tell this to a biologist, but there is something really interesting going on here in terms of uh, at least information here or coding theoretic problem in terms of reconstruction through traces and the dependence of the length of the sequence. And it's, uh, uh, the proofs and all the results based are based on something called the turnpike problem, really well studied in computer science, that you can look up uh, online. There are blogs and blogs about it, a pretty interesting problem. And just the two quick announcements, I promise I'll be done very quickly. If you want to see the robots in action, how genotyping is performed in labs, and a lot of interesting results, you can go to the Institute of Mathematics and Applications in Minnesota. They have a, we had a workshop that we organized at the beginning of this year uh, on group testing in biology. And there are a lot of interesting talks, presentations, uh, data result, different results, data sets. And there's a challenge of who can design the best coding matrices for some of these problems. And then on ISIT this year, there will be a tutorial on bioinformatics. Um, a little bit more on bioinformatics rather than biology that I'm going to present with Sharon now where I'm from UC Berkeley. And thanks so much for being here and sorry for going over time.